Like Brie mentioned, my name is Alex. I'm part of the CARS Center um, based out of the University of Southern California. I'm going to talk a little bit about what we're doing here, but I'm also going to just for those on the call that are maybe that are engineers that are interested in developing open source devices, but don't necessarily have experience with medical devices specifically, I want to give a little bit of an overview of sort of what challenges exist that are medical device specific and what that means for open source development. And then highlight some other, you know, some other success stories that can maybe inspire us all to, uh, to continue down this path. So first, a little bit about our project. So Open Nerve is a platform that's developed by the CAR Center, where I'm working now. It's funded through the NIH, which is the US government agency that does a lot of the medical research here. And um, the mission is to create an open source system for bioelectronic medicine, meaning that we're creating an implantable device that interacts with the nerves and that innervate the different organs of the body in order to treat or cure different diseases. So you can see our device over here on the right. What we've made is a similar to a traditional implantable pulse generator that say is used for pacemakers or other implantable devices, but with some different capabilities, it's more flexible. There can be more leads, more electrodes or sensors attached to it. And the different groups that are a part of our center are all working on all sorts of different, um, either stimulation treatment leads or sensing leads. It can be used by different researchers to create these closed loop therapies. One of the great things about this project is that it is specifically mandated to be open source, which is one of the reasons why I joined. Um, all of the designs that we've made, all the testing protocols, and as we continue, all of the testing results are all going to be released on our GitHub page under the uh, CCBY 4.0 license, meaning that the, the designs are available to anybody anywhere in the world to do whatever they want with it. Um, I, if you're interested, I encourage you to either reach out to me. I'd love to set up individual calls and just chat about what we're doing. Um, we also have a webinar on YouTube where each team that's part of our center goes through exactly what they're building and the technical details. Um, and you can always, of course, visit our GitHub. We have a wiki um, that explains some of the different technical things and our website. So. Now onto the main presentation and really quick, just a disclaimer, I'm gonna to touch a little bit on liability, but I wanna say that I'm definitely not a lawyer. I'm an engineer by training. So uh, please don't take anything I say as legal advice. Um, I'm also from the US and I've been a part of medical device development here for many years. Um, so most of what I say is based on my own experience with US and then to a lesser extent, European Union um, regulations and the pathway forward. One of the reasons that I'm very excited about GOSH is that I want to learn more about different parts of the world. I'm already planning on reaching out to Rejoy to learn more about the regulatory pathway in India. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm very interested in how these things either apply or don't apply to different parts of the world. So to start with, I want to just start with the basics of what is a medical device. So the definition of a medical device um, the wording is a little bit different depending on who you ask, but they all involve use in humans. So this is not for animals or for research. Um, and it does either a diagnostic or a therapeutic, meaning that it either detects if there is a disease or a disease state or it actually treats it. And it's not a drug, right? It works through non-chemical and non-biological means. Um, within that definition, medical devices can include a broad range of things, anything from very simple like a tongue depressor or Band-Aid to more complex things like the MRI machine that Rejoin mentioned, to things like the like pacemakers or implants, like what I'm working on. It can even extend to software, which I think is really important to remember as a, um, an open source developer. So there are many pieces of software that are medical devices. Um, one of those examples could be, say, virtual reality software to treat different diseases such as PTSD or OCD. Um, another one, which there's actually several open source projects involved, um, would be, say, a smartphone app or a piece of software for people with diabetes that connects like a glucose monitor to an insulin pump in order to provide better treatment. Even though there's not an actual hardware piece involved, these are still medical devices. Oh, sorry. One important thing is that medical devices are not research tools, right? There is a difference. That difference is very meaningful when you think about how to actually get what you're doing to the people that it could help. 
So tools, even tools for clinical research that gather data from humans are not necessarily medical devices, though there is, of course, a big overlap. And for many, for many research studies, even if it's a purely informative, just gathering data study, you would do want to use a medical device because it has been proved to be safe. Um, also, I love all the sci-fi stuff about augmenting the human body, connecting our brains to computers and stuff. Um, while some of those projects are very cool, and I know there is a big sort of biohacking community out there, that's not exactly relevant to the things I'm going to talk about with medical devices, though it's very cool. So when you design any, any medical device, or when you design anything, really, you have to think about who you're trying to help and who you're trying to, who would be actually using your device. Um, obviously, the patient, whoever, whoever has a disease or has a, an issue that your medical device would help with, they are the primary customer, but there's a huge amount of other people that are involved in the decision of whether or not somebody can use this, right? There's doctors who are necessary in many cases to not only, not only suggest something to use, but even set it up, or in the case of what I'm doing, to actually implant this in the body. Um, there's insurance companies, whether that's like a private insurance or like in many countries, a national insurance that decide whether something is accessible to the different clinic clinicians and doctors. Hospitals can decide what to purchase, what to not use. Um, and then very important, I think, caregivers and say stay-at-home nurses or family members can oftentimes be the one to really decide if the person they're caring for has access to a tool or not. There's also the regulatory side of things. Um, it's, there, there's many reasons that, well, if you, if you don't, if you don't pay attention to the regulatory side of medical devices, in many cases, it'll be illegal for you to even just give away your device to a patient. Um, and I'll go into sort of how that works here next. So this is going to be again, very U S based, um, but here in the U.S. and in a lesser extent, or I guess in a similar way, the EU, um, in order to get from designing a device to actually use in a human, use in the person you're trying to help, there's actually a very sort of long and torturous pathway. So the first thing you need to do with your device is you need to actually build it. And in order to build it with the required documentation, you need to manufacture it under what's called a QMS or quality management system. Um, this means just documenting every every step that goes into manufacturing, making sure that the people that are doing the manufacturing, that you know exactly who builds the thing and that they do the exact same steps every time. So that not only is the design correct, but you can trace if there's any problems back to improving the manufacturing. After manufacturing or sort of in parallel, um, you need to do a lot of documentation. Um, the, the most I guess impactful or maybe the most important is this risk and hazard analysis where you go through everything that could possibly go wrong and then you figure out what you need to do to mitigate those risks. Um, many of the mitigation steps are testing. There's very many standard tests. There's international standards for how to test medical devices. Um, for many of the other ones, especially the like long-term safety test, you do need to test in animals. So this would involve, for example, for my device, implanting it in a large animal, say a pig or a sheep, for up to three months, and then afterwards testing to make sure that there was no harm given to the sheep, there was no inflammation, that, there, that the tissue around the device was not damaged. Um, all of this data is really necessary before going to human just to ensure that you don't accidentally do harm when you're trying to help. Once this is done, there's two pathways forward in the United States, um, depending on how risky your device is. For a non-significant risk device, you would be able to go to an individual hospital or an individual clinic and a panel of people at that hospital, this IRB is Institutional Review Board. So it's just the, usually the administrators and leaders at the hospital would be able to take a look at your device and what you plan to do with it and say either that, yes, this is okay, or no, we think we need more data. For more risky devices, like an implant, like a pacemaker, say, you would actually here in the US have to go to the Food and Drug Administration and get a panel there to look over all of your data. And that can be a, a, a long process. It's, Chris can maybe tell you a little bit more about this in the, next, um, in the next set of slides, but there's usually many back and forth meetings where you have to sort of go through all of your data and show that what you're doing is both safe and helpful for the patient. And only once they approve 
can you use your device in a patient for the first time? And this isn't even approval. Um, once you do this, you're, it's very limited. You can, use, you can use your device in a specific hospital or group of hospitals for a specific purpose. In order to get larger approval, you have to go through the, the entire approval pathway, which may include clinical studies. Um, the, the different pathways depend on how risky your device is. Again, for low risk devices, such, such as maybe stethoscopes or masks, you actually just need to fill out the paperwork and there's no review process. For medium risk devices, which is actually the vast majority of medical devices, there's two ways forward. If it's, if it's just, I, I say just, but if it's substantially equivalent to another device on the market, you basically need to do tests to make sure that it's safe and then fill out paperwork arguing that your device is basically the same as something that's already been approved. So you should be able to enter the market or, you know, be accessible to doctors just like that other device. And that's a very common pathway forward. For something that's brand new, maybe it's not super high risk, but it's never been done before, you, um, you do usually have to include some clinical data demonstrating safety, but it's not as rigorous as running an entire full clinical trial. And then for class three devices, which is where sort of the world that I live in with these are implants, these are pacemakers, electronic devices, um, you have to prove both safety and efficacy using clinical data, meaning there's usually a smaller study for safety. And then once that's been shown, a larger study to prove that your device is, is helpful enough to patients to justify the risk. Um, only once this is done will the FDA in our case, or in my case, give permission to either sell the device or even just give it away, give it to doctors and hospitals. And just as an aside, I mean, I... I would love to just go around this and give directly to people, just have everybody get access to these devices. But like I said before, in many cases, this could be illegal. And even if it's not illegal, I'll talk in the next slide, you could incur liability and get sued. And there's, you have to make sure that your project is sustainable. And if there's a possibility that you harm somebody and then that could shut down the whole project, it's better to go through the proper steps and to to test and ensure that you don't cause harm when you're trying to help. There's also other, other reasons why you might not want to go directly to people and why you might want to go through the, through the entire pathway, even if you can get around sort of the legal liability issues. Um, for one, many times a doctor or a physician is necessary to use the device. I mean, you know, depends on the risk level, but I would not want to, I would not want patients or I would not want people to be sort of doing surgery on themselves and implanting them. Um, and then more importantly, if there is sort of a, a maker step where people would have to construct their own device based on your designs, then that really limits how many people you can help. You might be able to reach, you know, a few hundred people who have the tools and the knowledge to put together what you build. But if you get proper approval and can distribute your device, you can reach thousands and millions of people that need help. And just as a quick aside, liability around medical devices is complex like any legal thing, and I'm not a legal expert, but I wanted to highlight, I want to start getting away from how medical device is hard and highlight how open source systems and open source groups have sort of, have gotten around many of these issues and um, succeeded with relatively little resources. So one way people have succeeded is there's, they realize that if you, if you give somebody code and the person compiles that code, you as the person writing the code are not liable. Like there's no risk there. And so there are groups such as OpenAPS who does software for diabetes patients that release code that's created by the community and they don't have to worry about that regulatory pathway because anybody who needs that code can compile it themselves. Um, the caveat to that is that if you release code but then a doctor recommends their patient use that code, the doctor is then liable. So going through this pathway it, it does limit it does limit doctors and caretakers from recommending things because of the liability issue. There's another there's another pathway that groups have used, um, which is around 3D printing, because it turns out that the act of taking a CAD design and putting it in a 3D printer is similar to compiling, and that like the person who actually presses print is the manufacturer. So there are groups that design say prosthetic devices, and give those designs to the people in need and the people in need manufacture them. And there's no issue with liability since there's not, 
there's not this sort of transfer of a medical device from a person who's making it to a person who's needing it. And then finally, there is, at least in the US, some broad, I guess, immunity to designers. If somebody else, another say a company, takes your open source design and manufactures it. So there have been cases in the past where somebody puts a design online and then a different company just takes it and manufactures it. And it turns out the original designer is not liable. So um, there is there is safety there for people who are putting things online. Um, Rejoy gave a great definition from Oshawa of what open source hardware is. Um, it's one of the ways, I guess one of the reasons why I'm going into all these difficulties is that hopefully you recognize that making something open source hardware and medical devices isn't just releasing designs online. You also need to release all of the different paperwork and testing protocols and animal experiment, experimental data, everything that a person would need to create, make, and distribute a device. Um, I think that's important to realize or important to keep in mind. But I do think it's still worth it to go forward with open source medical devices. Um, there's a huge amount of benefits that can come from it, both in terms of giving access to different researchers and doctors who are developing new therapies. Um, one very important thing is it allows people to perform maintenance on their own medical devices or on their patients' medical devices if you're a doctor. Um, and then it creates a, it can, you can use that to create a community of people that are working together to, to help, yeah, that are working together to help solve these big problems that people face. Brady, I'm guessing that I'm out of time. Um, I know my, my face has popped up. Um, yeah, if you want to take another minute to, to wrap up and then we can make sure we get, uh, some time for Chris, that would be great. Thank you. Yeah, sorry about that. Um, yeah, very last slide I have, I just wanted to highlight some other success stories in open source medical devices. Um, one of the big ones we've seen has been respirators and ventilator projects over during COVID where the huge community from everywhere in the world came together to really, to help design and produce devices for this urgent need. Um, there's also been a huge amount of development for diabetes treatment. I mentioned open APS, which is a software that just is the community built and is distributed to help improve diabetes treatment. There's another similar one called Loop. There's these two communities sort of working in parallel to build that. Um, one interesting thing I wanted to highlight is Tidepool is a group that took the Loop software and while maintaining the open source of it, they, they actually did go through that regulatory pathway. So they now have an app that can be distributed directly to patients without them having to know enough software to like download a development environment and compile their own software. Um, I won't go into details of all of these, but there's, the it's really inspiring, I think, to see these different groups deal with the difficulties of making a medical device and figure out creative solutions to get what they're building to the people in need and to create a self-sustaining growing community, um, even in this, you know, even in this field that can be sort of intimidating to get into for an individual engineer. And with that, yeah, I'm I'm very excited and interested to learn from everybody in GOSH to expand my sort of viewpoint from the EU to or from the US to the rest of the world and to hopefully uh, yeah, be, be a part of this community.